Welcome. On behalf of the Australian Society for Computers and Law and our co-hosts, the Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation, and Oz Australia, welcome to Governing in the Internet Age. Firstly, we acknowledge the First Nations people from each of the lands from which we gather today. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. My name is Natalia Sinemarkovic, and I lead the Australian Society for Computers and the Law Future Law Network. Tonight, our guest is the Honourable Paul Fletcher, Federal Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. While in office, Paul has overseen multiple reforms across infrastructure and communications, copyright and cyber safety. Paul will be joined by Professor Miria Bennett-Moses, Director of the Allens Hub, Professor of Law at the University of New South Wales and co-lead of the Law and Policy theme in the Cyber Security Cooperative Research Centre. To conclude this event, James Riley, Founder and Editorial Director of Innovation Oz, will present conversation highlights and give our vote of thanks to our speakers. James has a long and distinguished career as a technology reporter in Australia and across Asia. Please post your questions throughout the session via Q&A. The webinar will, be, will run for around 45 minutes and will be recorded. So now over to you, Lyria and Paul to discuss governing in the internet age. So, good evening. Fantastic. I'm so excited that we could resolve those technical issues um, and, and be, have this conversation. I've got to say, I've been really looking forward to it. I enjoyed um, your book very much. Um, it, it's, a, it's, it's far faster to read than, than most academic works with fewer footnotes and, and more sort of substance to it. So I really appreciate that. So thank you. I thought I'd start with just a very broad question, which is what are you hoping the reader will understand after reading the book? In other words, what are its core messages? Thanks, uh, Lydia. It's great to be with you um, and with all involved in tonight's presentation. When I was approached by Monash University Publishing and asked to write something for the In the National Interest series, I reflected on the fact that it was uh, around 25 years ago that I personally got involved in this space when I started work for then Communications Minister Richard Dawson in 1996. And at that time, the internet was just coming out of the lab. It was something that was used by a relatively small number of researchers and academics around the world. And very rapidly, it became a mass market consumer phenomenon. So that created some challenges for governments because governments were caught on the back foot it took a while for governments to realise just how pervasive the internet had become. And what I try to do in the book, first of all, is just sketch out some of the historical developments, you know, the arrival of, the, of, of web browsers, so you no longer had to key in complicated programming language to be able to use the internet. Um, the arrival of the smartphone in 2007 was a really big change because it just hugely boosted the numbers of people who were connected to the internet it also meant that we're all carrying a device that can record uh, still photo, uh, video, sound, and instantly upload in a way that can be seen by millions or even billions of people, things that we're experiencing or witnessing or participating in. So I suppose the messages I'm trying to communicate in the book are, number one, and this is pretty trite, the internet changed everything. Number two, it changed everything for government. Um, and number three, it took governments a little while to respond and I guess to build confidence in how they responded. But I suppose my fourth message is I argue in the book through things like the News Media Bargaining Code that we legislated at the start of this year and other measures, I argue those are evidence that governments are now becoming more confident about how to regulate the internet and we certainly don't accept the proposition that was seriously being put even just a few years ago that the internet in some way should be beyond the reach of government and that the rule of law in some way should not apply to online interactions. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. Um, I thought I'd just, you know, maybe ask a slightly more sort of, I suppose, you know, question as an author um, of a book like this. So it's not often that a minister has time and takes the time to write a book in a substantive policy area. 
Um, you said you were approached by Monash, but what drove you to say yes? Well, um, <laughs> a range of factors, but I did feel there was something interesting to say. And I wanted to make the argument that if, if you look at the Online Safety Act, which we passed through the Parliament just a few months ago and it will take effect in January next year, if you look at the News Media Bargaining Code, if you look at some of the other things that we're doing, uh, the work cooperatively between uh, Commonwealth Attorney General and State and Territory Attorneys General on defamation law on the internet, um, I wanted to argue that there's actually some pretty significant things happening and really to, I suppose, underline the significance of some of the policy work that's being done um, and also make this argument that in a whole range of ways, engaging with the online world and the internet is really a key priority for government. And in the book, I suppose one of my key messages in the book is it's natural in government that we focus on the way the internet creates new problems. And I, you know, I give the example of um, the problem of unauthorised sharing of intimate images. If you'd said to people 20 years ago, there will be a problem in the future that um, uh, uh, people and overwhelmingly women will be exposed to this risk of uh, an intimate image that they might have shared in the context of a, a personal relationship suddenly is made public without their agreement and, you know, that's devastating to people it happens to, acutely, you know, embarrassing, agonising, and what people want most of all is to have that taken down as quickly as possible. So it's natural that governments and people speaking to governments can tend to focus on the negatives that the internet has brought. But I also seek to argue in the book my strong view that it's overwhelmingly been a net economic and social positive. And I spend quite a lot of time in the book talking about how the internet, for example, gives us all as consumers much better options, much more choice, um, and we have access to an abundant range of services that were not available even 20 years ago. Uh, and I also talk about the way that the internet, for example, can help governments deliver services. So you look at the work done by my colleague, Stuart Robert, who's got responsibility for the Digital Transformation Agency at the Commonwealth level, or Victor Dominello with Service New South Wales. Australians have come to expect that you get great service from your bank or your travel agency, your airline online. Naturally enough, they expect that dealing with government is going to be made more efficient and less painful and you're not going to have to spend hours queuing to get your licence. Governments have been a bit slow to respond to that, but now we're seeing some pretty good progress. So long-winded way of saying, I guess, I felt that um, writing a longer piece, it's, it's 20,000 words, so it's not, you know, it's not an 80,000-word book, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mini book. Um, but I felt that it was um, consistent with, I guess, my set of ministerial responsibilities um, and my, my policy interest and our government's policy interest in how do we best use the internet to serve Australians um, and to help Australians capture the economic and social benefits that the internet brings and being aware of some of the risks it also brings and how do we protect Australians against those. Thank you. So I'm going to delve into some of those points you raised then because I think there's a number of strands there that, that, that are worth picking up on. But if I can just ask the audience, and we've already got a couple of questions, um, to put questions in the Q&A and I'll get to as many of those as I can as well. Um, but before I do that, um, I, I wanted to, um, I suppose, delve a bit into the domain of online content regulation. And you mentioned some of the sort of real concerns there about, you know, intimate image abuse and so forth in particular. And, and you also mentioned earlier on the idea of government confidence growing in terms of what it does on the internet. And this is an area where the you know, Australian governments, and I'm going back in history now, there have been various sort of policies from a kind of, you know, let it rip internet type policy all the way through to a sort of internet filter. Um, you know, how do you feel that the current policy, and in particular the Online Safety Act, balances sort of those concerns that have been a struggle for a long time, namely sort of freedom of speech versus online safety? You're absolutely right. There's a, there's a delicate balancing act there. I guess the starting point is that 
we're in a world today where any, any person, any ordinary citizen can express an opinion, make a statement that at least potentially can be seen by thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of people. That's unprecedented. Even 20 years ago, for almost all of us, freedom of speech in practical terms meant, well, if you wanted to go and you know stand at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park in London or the equivalent that operated in the Domain in Sydney for a while, you could do that and maybe 20 or 30 people would listen to you. You could you know harangue your friends and neighbours, but most people would never hear what you were saying. Um, economically, to, to be able to... Uh, express a view in a, in a way that was heard by thousands or, or more, that really the only people who had that power were the operators of media businesses, either government-owned or, or privately owned, and very few people ever got past the gatekeepers, the editors and others. So the internet, first of all, has led to, in practical terms, an enormous flourishing of freedom of speech. Now, um, people ask the question, you've got you know, Facebook or Twitter or whichever platform it might be, now we've got a privately owned company, as it were, regulating what is the new public square. Does that raise novel problems? In one sense, it does. But in another sense, again, privately owned media businesses have always regulated access to the town square. Just what's different was historically, it was only a tiny number of people who ever even got, got into the town square. Now it's very large numbers of people. But I guess what we have sought to do as a government, for example, with our Online Safety Act is, so we started uh, back in 2015 with legislation establishing a scheme to deal with the cyberbullying of children. And if content met, um, you know, defined statutory test uh, such that it was considered to be cyberbullying, then if you, as a person under 18, uh, were on the receiving end of, such abuse, such cyberbullying, step one, complain to the platform. If they don't respond, step two, go to the uh, what we initially called the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, later become the E-Safety Commissioner, and there's a scheme backed by legislative power of the E-Safety Commissioner to direct that the material be taken down. What we're, now, we've now had several years of operating that. It's worked effectively. We've added to the responsibilities of E-Safety with, for example, a skill, the scheme to deal with the unauthorised sharing of intimate images, as I mentioned before. And now, as part of the Online Safety Act, we're expanding that to um, a serious online abuse of adults. Now, we've set a higher threshold appropriately because you do have to balance freedom of speech issues and our adults are more resilient. But at the end of the day, the eSafety Commissioner will have the power. If it meets the test of, of serious online abuse, it needs to be uh, essentially a content or a statement that an ordinary person, a reasonable person would regard as menacing, harassing or offensive and as intended to cause harm to an individual. So that's quite a high bar. But if that bar is met, then uh, the platform will be under an obligation to remove the material if there's an order from the safety commissioner. So long way of saying what we try to do is balance up freedom of speech issues but also uh, safety issues to do it in a way that's governed by the rule of law against transparent statutory criteria administered by a, uh, you, you know, an appointed official. Um, and so we're saying very clearly, we don't think that conduct that occurs online should be beyond the reach of the law. Australians, without thinking about it all that carefully, as I talk about in the book, just instinctively expect but just as you have the protection of the rule of law in the physical town square and you can go to the police or you can bring a legal action, um, similarly, that should be available to you when you interact in the, in the digital town square. Thank you. So I've got, I'm going to pick up on those themes, actually, rule of law and, and transparency, um, because there's a couple of questions um, from the audience um, that sort of relate to those themes. And I'm going to try to meld them together because I, I think they're, they're sort of related. So obviously the rule of law is important um, and, and the transparency is important, at least in, in this question, not only in terms of what, you know, a statutory test is, but also the sort of behind the scenes process, which links to the other question, which is around sort of consultation with the public in the process of drafting legislation. So if we sort of bring those things together, the idea of the rule of law, the idea of democratic engagement and the idea of transparency in the lawmaking process. 
Um, you know, what, what do you see as important in this space? And in particular, what do you think, if anything, should be done differently um, going forward to sort of improve sort of, you know, democracy, um, government transparency and so forth? It is important that we have a proper transparent process. Certainly with the Online Safety Act, we took to the 2019 election a promise that we would uh, strengthen our online safety arrangements. We issued a quite extensive discussion paper at the end of 2019. We issued an exposure draft of legislation at the end of 2020, an extensive consultation in respect of both of those sets of documents before we introduced legislation into the parliament early, um, sort of early in, in 2021. I guess the other point is this, that one of the things that is really novel about the internet is that these are global platforms. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all of them are operating in 100 plus countries around the world. And we need to, certainly the Australian government needs to assert its, you know, its sovereign right to make laws protecting Australians and regulating interaction in a way that keeps people safe. We also need to think about how we balance that up with the fact that these are global corporations. You know, it's, it's pretty novel. We've had multinational corporations, of course, for you know, at least a couple of hundred years, arguably longer if you think about the, you know, the East India Company and so on. But it is quite novel that large numbers of Australians will be using services, purchasing products delivered by a business that may have no physical presence in Australia, may not have no employees in Australia, um, uh, that raises some challenging issues. So um, I think you start with the, the well-established principles of how democratic and elected governments operate um, and you do things like sharing exposure drafts and giving people the chance to comment. And... I, I use an analogy in the book about how we as a country deal with the global manufacturing and regulation of cars. Clearly, government has a strong interest on behalf of the community in automotive safety. At the same time, there are economic advantages for Australian consumers if the rules here are broadly the same as in most other countries. So these giant global manufacturers, Toyota and Volkswagen and so on, um, can produce vehicles as economically as possible and make them as affordable as possible for consumers in Australia or anywhere else. The way we reconcile those things is that, you know, we have a Road Vehicle Standards Act, a Commonwealth Act, that sets the requirements that a vehicle must meet before it first goes on the road in Australia. Um, but we incorporate by reference a lot of global road safety rules and design requirements that are set by a UN agency. But we retain, we assert and maintain the right to impose Australian specific rules. If we're not comfortable with the global position on, um, you know, seat belts or um, any other kind of safety requirement, we'll assert the right to, and we do, uh, to regulate additionally or specifically. And I think that's not a bad analogy for how we should deal as a government with global corporations that are delivering services into the Australian market, but also into um, markets in many other countries around the world. And in relation to that, is there anything we can draw out of what happened with the news media bargaining code? Um, and in particular, I suppose the sort of initial reaction that the big tech companies had to that idea as compared with, say, just recently Google's new digital future initiative where previously it had threatened to leave Australia if, if we went ahead and now it's looking to invest in Australia. So, so is, there, is, that, is there any lessons from sort of that history in terms of government's ability to actually regulate big tech companies and, and, and ensure that, you know, the way that the democratic elected government of Australia wants things done is, is done despite the difficulties? I think there are some important lessons. The first point is, as the Prime Minister said, the Treasurer said, as I said, pretty repeatedly late last year, early this year, we wanted and continue to want Facebook and Google to be active participants in the Australian economy. 
the, the employers here, Google more significantly than Facebook, but both employ people here. Um, they're uh, major providers of services. Australians have demonstrated that they value their services and use them in large numbers. But we also say if you do business in Australia, you have to comply with the laws established by the democratically elected government. Now, I talk in the book about the fact that we've, We've seen this play out a number of times. When we changed the laws in relation to GST to impose, to remove the previous exemption that said essentially um, uh, online transactions for less than $1,000 would be GST exempt, we changed that because it was not competitively neutral. It put Australian physical shopfront retailers at a disadvantage to global online retailers. Uh, when we changed that, Amazon were very unhappy and they threatened to leave the Australian market and they did for a few months, but they came back. So I think the lesson is um, uh, governments and the Australian government um, can and must assert its sovereign authority, but you do have to do so in a way that properly respects all of the legitimate interests of all the parties. So we were very careful in the way we did the News Media Bargaining Code. It started with the then Treasurer and our Prime Minister asking the ACCC to do a substantial piece of work, the Digital Platforms Inquiry. That ended up being a, a multi-hundred page piece of work with 23 recommendations. They started that early 2018, reported to government mid-2019. We responded late 2019. One of the recommendations was there ought to be a code governing the relationship, the commercial relationship between news media businesses like Seven West Media, Nine Entertainment Limited and so on on the one hand and Google and Facebook on the other because the conclusion of the ACCC based upon classic competition and market power analysis was that there was a market power problem that Google on Facebook had substantial market power. As a consequence of that, they were using content paid for and generated by Australian news media businesses, such as a two-minute clip that might have been on, on Nine News one night, very successfully using that to attract eyeballs to their platforms, monetizing that with uh, digital advertising revenue, but not having the commercial negotiations they ought to have with Nine to say, okay, what are the terms on which we can use this? And so... We laid out a clear framework in the legislation. We consulted, you know, there was an exposure draft. In fact, there were a couple of exposure drafts. There was a Senate committee. It is important to go through all of that proper process, um, but at the same time, it's important to have, you know, to have carefully thought through the policy framework. And I'll just make one other point there. The use of codes as a, a, to frame or to regulate the commercial relationship between power, uh, companies with substantial market power and parties they're dealing with commercially is a well-established feature of Australian competition law, in part, I think, because, you know, we're a relatively small market, so in most, most sectors there's only a couple of big players, so we're quite well used to, and our, the ACCC is quite well used to dealing with those kinds of market power issues. So we were able to use what's a policy tool that's quite commonly used in competition law in Australia, perhaps in larger economies like the US, the UK, you know, France, Germany, they're not so familiar with that. So there was an element of a sort of quite distinctive Australian regulatory tool being used there. Okay, I've got, got a question, a number of questions from the audience, and I'll get to as many of them as I can, but there's one I think that sort of specifically um, relates to, to this point which is about the, um, the fact that, you know, one of the challenges is a lot of these companies are overseas. And so, so when, you, when Australia makes laws, um, there's all of those difficulties, which, as you've pointed out, can sometimes be overcome. But I suppose the question's coming at it from a different way and saying, well, instead of acquiring technology from overseas or, or, or having Australians rely on that, should we be, as the, you know, should the Australian government, I should say, be investing in homegrown um, technology by way of policy incentives or using its purchasing power? If you think about what are the policy questions that the internet raises for government, clearly right up the top is what is Australia's role on the production side of the internet? We're big consumers of technology. Australians are early adopters. We were, our take up of mobile phones was very rapid in the 90s. And certainly we've taken up 
all kinds of uh, online products and services very rapidly. You know, Netflix, I think, had 1 million uh, subscriptions in Australia in 2015. It's now 14 million. And there were several hundred thousand people using Netflix through a VPN in Australia well before they launched here. I remember when I was an Optus executive in 2008, so the iPhone had launched in Australia in 2007. It didn't formally launch in Australia until about a year later. But the Optus engineers told me that by, I think it was about mid-2008, there were about 40,000 iPhones already on the network from Australians who'd gotten them from the US and had come back and you had to find somebody to so-called jailbreak and change the code, but a lot of people did that. So we were, as a nation, we we're early adopters. That's, that's a good thing. But the economic question is, okay, we're enthusiastic users of the internet on the consumer side, but where are we on the producer side if this is where so much economic activity is shifting, um, how does Australia get its fair part in that? Now, I talk in the book about the fact that because I've had the chance to work, you know, around the, particularly on the sort of public policy issues to do with the internet going back 25 years, I've had the chance to visit a lot of, um, you know, incubators and uh, technology parks and so on all around the world, Israel, Scandinavia, UK, US, and... Um, certainly 20 years ago, you'd come back from one of those visits and you'd feel a little bit um, depressed or, or underwhelmed about what we're doing in Australia. But that has just changed out of sight over really even over the last few years. And I think one interesting indicator is if you look at the most recent, um, you know, under 40 rich list, uh, half, half of the people on that list or more have made their money in technology. Even 10 years ago, it would overwhelmingly have been in sports and entertainment um, and, and property for people under 40 to be on that rich list. So there's a really big change, um, and you can look at businesses, obviously, like Atlassian and Canva, but there's a whole range of them. Um, and so uh, I do think we're seeing a really big transformation of the Australian economy. Um, uh, and the internet clearly means that Australian businesses are able to compete in a global market in ways that were previously not possible. Now, the downside of that is, or the flip side of that is, you're now in an intensely competitive global market. It's, it's pretty hard to just uh, say, okay, I'm, I'm going to serve the Australian market. I won't worry about competition globally. But, but you know, um, I think of a business like, uh, Coda Wireless based in Adelaide who does, they do software for connected and automated vehicles. Now um, they are suppliers to uh, businesses like General Motors um, and they're essentially developing and exporting software. They're not at a competitive disadvantage being in Australia. Whereas of course, if you're manufacturing, you know, big metal boxes, um, that is that is much harder. So um, I think the upside for a, a country like Australia is um, competing in internet-based businesses, of which so many are, so many businesses are now. Some of our traditional uh, the tyranny of distance is no longer a negative. Um, at the same time, to compete, you need to be world class because you you're competing against the best in the world. But you know you can look at. Um, um, even categories like buy now, pay later, where Australian businesses uh, have been have been innovators and um, have established a global position. So, long-winded way of saying, um, I think there's considerably uh, there, there's considerably more to point to now than there was 20 years ago about the amount of Australian internet-based economic activity, um, and that's a good thing. So there's a couple of questions about sort of privacy and surveillance. And I know there's a privacy law reform process that's actually in Attorney General's department. So if this isn't your domain, um, just say so. Um, but the, que there's a, the two questions are firstly about um, the idea of, of informed consent as being the basis on which data can be used given the ridiculous um, long um, policies that no one reads um, when you click through um, you know, to, to agree to use a particular service online. And the other one is about sort of the concern about surveillance of the population in the context of 
of smart cities um, and whether that's sort of an over surveillance um, and how the government proposes to manage the risks of that. I don't know if either of those is something you'd be able to comment on. Sure. Well, look, the first thing is to say that, you know, I work closely with my colleague, Michaelia Cash, the Attorney General. A lot of these issues, um, you know, don't fit neatly into portfolio um, boundaries. Similarly, I work closely with my colleague, Jane Hume, Minister for the Digital Economy, uh, Karen Andrews, Minister for Home Affairs, um, Peter Dutton is Minister for Defence because we've got the, the cyber security issues and the Australian Signals Director. And again, this goes to the point that the internet um, changes everything, including for governments and including, in, you know, a core responsibility of government, which is keeping people safe. Cyber safety, cyber security, they're slightly different things, but they're clearly joined up. And again, in a world where ordinary citizens, very many of us, are connected all the time and therefore engaging um, with people all around the world, whether you're um, gaming with somebody who might be in, you know, might be in Finland or um, might be in Korea um, or whether you're buying goods and services online. In many ways, ordinary citizens are much more engaged internationally than was the case uh, until quite recently. On that question of surveillance, it is a fascinating issue. I went back and looked um, fairly, you know, two or three years ago at the debate in Australia about the Australia card. I remember it pretty well because I was just getting involved um, in, uh, in politics at the time and the Liberal Party at the time, um, and I was a young Liberal then, um, was very exercised about the, um, the issue of the Australia card and this, did this mean big government and so on. What's fascinating is community attitudes and the way that so many of us have effectively um, accepted the, um, the sharing of a lot of information about our behaviour um, and, and we now, you know, there's, there, there's, if you look at people's behaviours, they're, they're, people understand that if... Um, if your airline knows how many flights you've been on, then you'll get points for each flight and there are some benefits that go with that. Um, now, what's critical is that it's fully informed consent, that people understand the full scope of the information that can be collected about you. And certainly ACCC Digital Platforms Inquiry has some interesting material about that, and that is in part what we're responding to with some of this uh, online um, uh, privacy work that the Attorney General is leading. But there's some interesting case studies in there about, you know, just the amount of data that is captured if you have a smart speaker, for example. So um, in the broad, I think uh, Australians, through their behaviours, um, well, start with the fact that almost all of us now carry a smartphone so effectively, that's a device which is recording where you are at any time of the day or night. Um, uh, so um, attitudes have evolved, but absolutely privacy is very important. And that notion of fully informed consent is really critical. Now we have some more excellent questions on everything from cybersecurity to facial recognition to transparency in government. Um, but we won't be able to get to all of those, although hopefully people can listen to future speeches in which some of them um, may be addressed. Um, thank you very much um, for the conversation. I know we didn't have a real live fireside, but I very much enjoyed the chat just as I did the book. So um, I really appreciate it. And um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to James to um, wrap up. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Paul Fletcher. Um, and thank you, uh, Lyria Bennett Moses, for that was a, a fantastic discussion covering um, an enormous amount of ground. Uh, Paul, it's just as well you've just written the book um, because you had a lot of uh, territory to cover. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, we're at a point in history where uh, things are in a bit of a state of flux. Um, uh, Paul, to your point, 
uh, about Australia has been, or the Australian government has really been at the forefront um, in a lot of areas on internet regulation. You know, we've seen this with the news media bar- bargaining code and obviously the Online Safety Act. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of questions being asked about uh, the influence of the internet. Um, on the one hand, Western democracies uh, sort of had this history on the internet, as you alluded to, of it, it being a, a little bit of a free-for-all and, and what happened online uh, was slightly more libertarian than what happened in the real world. Now, Scott Morrison has made it very clear uh, that the test he wants to see is that um, what you can do in the real world, you should be able to do online and vice versa. What you can't do uh, in the real world should also be penalised online. But uh, there are a myriad number of areas, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree, where, where there's, it's a contested space um, and uh, and it's fascinating right now that um, this discussion has uh, has progressed as far as it has even in the last several years. Um, and I think this conversation certainly reflected reflected that, and also the intense interest that um, uh, you know that the public has in this area. You don't have to be um, you don't have to be involved in the legal profession to have a fascination with what goes on um, with the smartphone in your pocket, as, as the minister was just saying. Uh, so I'll draw it to a close. Um, Thank you very much for joining the Australian Society for Computers and the Law, uh, the Decision Makers series. Uh, Thank you to Paul Fletcher again for that fascinating discussion and uh, to Professor Liria Bennett-Moses for really driving that that discussion so very well. Um, Our introduction from uh, the Alan's... uh, Sorry, I I think I've got this right, Natalia Cernomarkovic, uh, you are with Allens, and thank you for your introduction and the sponsorship of the uh, Allens Hub for Technology, Law and Innovation. I think I got all that right. Um, now, I had a glass of wine put next to me uh, when this thing started, and I haven't been able to touch it because I thought it would be a bad look. I've been taking notes. Um, but with that, I'll just say thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Minister. Thanks a lot.